Welcome to the EP Wealth Advisors Market Update. My name is Breen Murphy. I'm the Director of Client Experience here with EP Wealth Advisors. I'm joined, as I always am, by Adam Phillips. He's our Director of Portfolio Strategy. He's a Chartered Financial Analyst, a Certified Financial Planner, and you may have seen him quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Market Watch, uh, CNBC, and CNN. Um, this week, I'm especially excited to, uh, to announce that we're joined by a guest, uh, Professor Hamid Arabzadeh. He is a, a prof- an adjunct professor at UCLA's uh, School of Public Health, and he has been helping people with um, addressing the health and safety measures around the coronavirus, around COVID-19. So, so uh, pr- Professor Arabzadeh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and, and can you start by just giving a, a little bit of what's going on in your life and what are you, and a little bit of an overview on, on COVID-19 itself? Yeah, thanks, Brian, and, and hello, Adam. Uh, just a very, very quick background about me. I teach at UCLA School of Public Health, as you said, but I also have a, a management environmental consulting practice. And I also come from a different background. I've been an executive of several large companies, so I have a business uh, outlook as well. Uh, I wanted to also add a couple of other things. Uh, One is that's important, perhaps. uh, We hear a lot that uh, everybody or many people are saying, leave this uh, in the hands of scientists. And as a public health scientist, I agree with that. But this has to be done by advice and uh, good research and science from scientists, but also with very good public policy. So the only thing I want right. to say related to that area is that uh, we don't need politics, but we need good, sane public policy. Because at the end of the day, public policy setters uh, need to rely on good science and do it together. So it's not one or the other. The other yeah. thing I want to mention is that I'm not a physician. I'm not an MD, even though I teach public health uh, and areas related to it. But my specialty, in addition to uh, some of the specific um, the skills and topics in this is also looking at that interaction and intersection between business, public policy, public health, and the scientific method. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for, for, for giving us that background and thanks for joining us. You know, how about, uh, would you mind giving us a little bit of an overview on COVID-19? Like, you shared with me uh, a little bit around like what it is and how it works and, and what we should do to, 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 keep, to keep safe. Sure. So again, I just a bit of a disclaimer. So here I'm going to get what colleagues have said and are people whose specialty is virology, specialty is communicable disease or MD. Uh, so what I can tell you as somebody who uh, takes uh, the studies and looks at them and can uh, read abstracts. Uh, so uh, number one is uh, viruses uh, uh, are, of course, very different from bacteria. They're not uh, able to live on their own. They live on other organisms. And to very much oversimplify it, but uh, in a basic manner, there are really two families of viruses. And again, this is oversimplification. There are the DNA viruses and the RNA uh, or the combinant uh, type of uh, viruses. The latter being the coronavirus, this novel coronavirus which unfortunately is not as stable as the former, as the DNA viruses. And that has a lot of ramifications on uh, what we are dealing with. Uh, mm-hmm. So this pro- family of coronaviruses have been around uh, for a long time, uh, but this one is new. It's literally the five, six months old, uh, and hence the difficulties with it in terms of scientists not having a, a body of knowledge. Um, so things that everybody has heard on a daily and hourly basis is extremely contagious. Uh, I will uh, send you a link, you may have seen it, to a video that our colleagues in Japan uh, show uh, the, how uh, it can even transmit and also uh, the signs of aerosols and how they remain in the air and uh, you know those kind of things. So those all relate to it. So in other words, for any organism, uh, any virus to impact the body, it has to have a mode of transmission. And unfortunately, uh, coronavirus, in addition to it being not a very stable virus, and again, we all know mm-hmm. it is, some of them are more stable, and uh, national uh, scientists are saying that it is more stable than other type viruses. Uh, but uh, there are two things, that uh, two more things that make this uh, a challenge. One is, of course, it's airborne, mm-hmm. uh, transmitted via air, which really makes it very, very difficult. Uh, and then the other one uh, is that uh, uh, it's... Uh, it's 
extremely you know, contagious. So both of these, there are other airborne uh, organisms that are also, you know, through, transmitted through air, but it's not as contagious. So these are kind of the challenges added to everything else that caused this problem. And then there are other things, uh, the fact that, as I said, there is not enough uh, knowledge at all uh, because it's not being studied, it's not been around. Uh, but the very good news is that, uh, you know, we have uh, amazing scientists in this country and around the world, and uh, they will uh, conquer this. Mm. Okay, great. So, so uh, I mean, I hear that it's very, it's very viral, um, that it, it's, it's, you know, there's a level of contagiousness. But can you talk to me a little bit about the mortality of it? And, and also, as we get into that, a, a little bit around social distancing and, and how that might play a role in helping. Uh, right. So uh, the, the mortality rate has become even a controversial thing. And one would think and hope that when it comes to physical sciences, that uh, there would be a little less uh, uh, type of a, a controversy. But... Uh, this is an issue uh, that is becoming uh, maybe more scientifically established. As uh, most people have heard last week, uh, results of a study in New York was uh, released that the New York State public health officials tested 3,000 random people. And 13 to 15 percent of people were positive, meaning that they either had the disease or had the antibodies. So it's extremely pre prevalent. And that is what... Uh, when our colleagues in finance, uh, including some of your executives, have said, what is the denominator? Because without the denominator in any mathematics calculation, we cannot know what the rate is. So it seems the number of people who have been impacted or have contracted or have been infected by this virus is a lot more. Now, is that number 5%, 10%, 20%? The Stanford study uh, is uh, saying that it's more more like uh, in the neighborhood of 15%. But the reality is that we know uh, it's already a very large number. And I would be surprised of the one, uh, I'm sorry, of the 2 million uh, reported uh, the cases worldwide, or 3 million, I think, now as of today, that we may have 10 million. I would not be surprised that if it's 20 million. And if you add to it uh, the fact that there are some countries that are just uh, either don't have the ability to tabulate the results, or uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, politically, have not been forthcoming, that then all lends itself to the mm -hmm. lower mortality rate. And the last thing I want to say about mortality rate is that this disease, even though they say viruses, you know, can impact everybody, it's democratic, but it really isn't in a case that it can impact people, but the responses to it have been very different. And in Italy, where there is more data now, uh, the comorbidity uh, amongst those who have, uh, you know, lost their precious lives has been two to three other uh, comorbidities associated with those who have died. Now, this doesn't mean that somebody who is 24 and is in perfect condition cannot have a severe problem, but mm -hmm. it's been extremely low compared to those who are older, who have underlying immunosuppressive uh, issue, issues that are going chemotherapy, have cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease, and obesity, uh, you know, the other ailments that uh, we have uh, in the world. So mm -hmm. I think we're going to find out uh, that uh, the mortality rate is far lower. And this, in a sadly, as much as it's been extremely tragic and every loss of life is very, very sad, uh, but uh, that may be uh, an area of to kind of, uh, you know, help us. Because I believe if this mortality rate was what originally was thought about, uh, I think we would have had, I'm going to use a very strong word, disasters, politically, economically, public health-wise. But thankfully, it doesn't have that. And I believe the measures that have been taken, including by our own uh, government, uh, state and federal, have really helped. So uh, okay. that relates to social distancing, which we can discuss. Okay. So so as I hear it, you know, it, it's a new virus. Um, it's very viral. It has a low mortality rate that is starting to look like it's even lower. Um, and we have taken these social distancing measures that have had a, a positive effect or, as they say, flatten the curve. Um, so the next question I have for you is, as we're starting to see that curve flatten and we're thinking about reopening the economy, can you talk and share with us a little bit about what those, those parameters are for reopening the economy as you see it and what could a new normal look like for us? 
So I actually wanted to say that some people are a little scared of the new normal, but mm. actually I believe parts of it are very good. You know, everybody mm. is now quoting Mr. Gates that many years ago he said that you know we'll have a viral uh, issue, and mm. uh, with all due respect to him and his great work, many scientists for years have been warning. Not only just about viruses, the lack of availability of basic public health, more than 40% of people in the world are going to have access to it. So mm -hmm. I think the new normal is that you pay much more attention. The new normal right. is that we realize providing very basic public health, inoculation, vaccination, access mm -hmm. to clean water, these are going to help all of us. Right. Another thing is that uh, I can speak from uh, personal uh, you know, experience. I've been traveling for business for over 35 years, extensively as an executive and other reasons. I got some allergies and any but anytime I got on a long flight uh, and somebody was sick close to me and the flu, I got it. Now the new normal is that if somebody has the symptoms, they already are educated. They're not going to get on that plane. If they've got the symptoms, they're not going to come. So not only for this, uh, the novel COVID-19, but already we've had tremendous benefits, and I'm using the word benefit, in the fact that uh, we have far less flu uh, episodes, mm -hmm. even though we are not officially in the flu season. I know in San Diego County, the rate of flu have dropped by several tens of percentage. So the new normal, some of it is what we should have been doing. We should right. have always washed our hands. And this is something I've always said. If people in the world have, have had access or had access to clean water, and everybody washed their hands, you could get rid of 34% of all communicable diseases. And it may be very simple, but it's extremely important. Now, with this one, uh, social distancing, uh, establishing uh, offices where uh, things are a little different. And now that's the new normal. The new normal is that in your offices and mine, we may establish workstations six feet apart. Uh, we may, uh, you know, make sure that only a few people get on an elevator. I know a large uh, leasing company that was already working in China, and they have the U.S. base. They're going to work on it. Uh, and uh, also uh, the, the fact that we're going to be all more aware. We're going to be more aware of public health issues. And in, in fact, by reducing the number of flus, other communicable diseases, which we will do by having all these measures in place, then we are going to have less fatalities from COVID-19 also. That's why the head of CDC uh, kind of uh, warned everybody that when the flu season is around, everybody has to be taking the flu shot. The flu shot rate uh, compliance in America has been under 50%. So if we combine all of this, we are going to succeed. And again, I am a big believer in uh, uh, democracy in America, in uh, the resilience of American people, uh, and with our scientists, I have no doubt that this will be defeated, and I don't think people should be scared. And uh, the last thing I want to say, and this is your expertise and Adam, but I've always believed when you have democracy, then uh, public health can also be served better, and I have no doubt that America will come out of this uh, very strongly. Yeah. Th thank you so much for this, this level of uh, expertise and insight, um, Prof Professor Orasadeh. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and and I think right now, we, we'd love to let you go. Um, and then we'll transition over to having Adam uh, you know, talk a little bit about those eco economic implications. Um, Adam, is there anything you wanted to say before we let uh, Professor Orasadeh go? Uh, no, Professor, that, that was really helpful for me to hear. I, I certainly do appreciate it. I'm happy I got to join on this uh, first part of the call. So thank you, Brie, for, uh, for including me here. Um, but uh, I, I certainly appreciate your remarks. Thanks, Professor. All right, Adam. So you, uh, you heard Professor Arado today. Uh, Arado today. Um, you know, he, he's obviously talking about um, you know, the virality, that this is going to be widespread. The mortality is looking like it's declining. Um, you know, he's talking about a new normal in which we may have different behaviors and different like work from home measures um, that that allow us to have like a different type of economy. But there's definitely a belief that we're going to come out of this, you know, very strong. So, you know, from as we wrap that up, my question to you is like, what are your like, how, what are your takeaways from this as we're in this also very tumultuous market as a result of it? So the, the way that I'm, I'm approaching this right now is you can look at things through 
uh, from the sector level and, and the individual stock level and see who's going to come out a winner or a loser uh, from this crisis. You can also take a step back and look at it from the broad asset allocation. So I, I think that's probably the best place to start. You know, we're, we're recording this when the, the S&P 500, the stock market is up close to 30% from the lows uh, hit, uh, it hit back in March. We're, we're about, uh, believe it, we're about 10% uh, down from, from where we started the year, still about 15% or so below our all-time high. So, but we've come back quite a bit. So I think it's important to ask, okay, where are we right now? Where do we go from here? You know, it's, it's um, you know, a, a lot of, I, I think that uh, in, in some ways, maybe the market sentiment is, is starting to outpace consumer sentiment. I, I do agree um, that we are going to come out of this stronger. Um, I think that the way that the market is, is casting its vote is saying that we're probably going to come out, not are we going to come out stronger, but we're going to come out faster than many had, had uh, anticipated. And so that's something where um, I, I think it's important just to mention the speed with which we've recovered has been incredibly impressive. If we, um, if we, I, I don't think that you ever see a, a stock market rally uh, in, in a bear market in a straight line. So even though we're, we're off, uh, we're, we're up about 30% from the lows, I, I don't know if I would expect that to continue. Um, I, I think that in, in terms of volatility, I, I think it's, a, it's likely that it'll remain with us because we are still kind of in this day-to-day -day environment where we're continuing to get new information. I think a lot of it is positive. We're seeing a lot of trends that suggest that, that the worst of this virus is behind us for sure. But I, I don't think that, um, you know, we're, we're approaching this new normal. I don't think that we can signal the all clear as soon as the threat of this virus disappears. I think that we are going to come out of this stronger but to to uh, to his point, it's it's um, it's going to change behaviors for quite some time, and I think there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve as people start to adjust to that new normal. And so I don't think we can expect this what they call that V-shaped recovery. In many ways, what the stock market is implying right now, where we are going to uh, just retrace to where we were before. I think as we start getting people back to work, there's going to be the stealing out period. And how close should I be getting to my colleagues? How do I interact with them, interact with people in the elevator? Uh, I, and I think all of these things is, is going to take some time to, uh, to adjust. So, you know, I, I think that's kind of how I see things from the asset allocation level. And, and there's certainly going to be clear winners and losers at the sector and stock level. And, and so to give you an example, um, we are, this is, you know, often what you see with uh, coming out of a crisis is, is you see these trends that were originally in place, you see the crisis kind of catalyze those trends. It serves yeah. as, that, as that catalyst to, to ignite that. Now, the, the, what I'm getting at here is that for years, we've been seeing this trend towards online shopping, right? Some people may have been reluctant to go to Amazon or order groceries online, have it delivered to them. Maybe they were, they were the late adopters. Um, what this crisis has done has caused that adoption. It's, it's forced people to start ordering things online, to have those groceries delivered. And I, and I think a lot of people are finding that it's actually pretty darn convenient. And, you know, they're probably asking themselves, what took me so long? This is amazing. And so I, I think that as we look at those types of companies that are going to come out of this stronger, it's those that have an online presence or are investing a lot of, of their, uh, their money into those resources online to drive e-commerce because those are going to be the clear winners uh, even when this is over. Okay. Well, Adam, I mean, I think that was a great summary. There's a couple things I wanted to, to, to just better understand from you, right? So as you were giving you know, a good perspective of, uh, of how the market has rebounded but may not be in a V-shaped recovery, uh, last week you wrote, you wrote an article on our website um, about oil and sort of the behavior you've seen from oil and like, uh, like kind of a historically unique behavior. Um, you know, you've talked a little bit about unemployment claims, uh, corporate earnings. Can you share a little bit about the types of things that you're, you're evaluating, um, you know, and, and as well as the investment team on where are we in this, in, in this recovery and what can we expect going forward? Yeah, sure, Brain. So there's, we're always looking at data. That's something that that we try to hammer home. And you know, whenever we speak or whenever 
um, I write on a blog or in a newsletter, we focus on data. We don't focus on, on the headlines, on that noise. The hard part right now is that this, uh, you know, this world is, is changing faster than the data, right? So a lot of the data we're getting, it's backward looking. It's not tremendously helpful. You know, a lot of the data that we're getting from the first quarter, you, know, you, you, you mentioned companies are, we're, we're in this earnings season right now. This is actually going to be the busiest week in terms of earnings season. About a third of companies in the S&P 500 are scheduled to report this week. You know, what they're, the numbers that they're going to be telling us from their first quarter aren't tremendously helpful. Because we know that within the U.S., a lot of the pain didn't really start until the back half of March. So first quarter earnings aren't that helpful right now. We're going to be focused on, from them, we're going to be focused on what they see going forward. How, how do their cash flows look? Um, when do they see business start to get back to a normal level? Um, that's what we're more focused on in terms of, in terms of the corporate outlook. Um, you know, and the, the the rest of the information this week we're getting um, we're getting the first quarter GDP number. That's going to be great. You know, a lot of these numbers that we're getting, we know they're going to be bad. I think the question is how bad are they going to be? But again, this is looking in the rearview mirror. This is telling us where we're coming from. Not very helpful, right? So, what do we look at? Well, one of the those indicators that we've been a big fan of for a while, and that I think has gone mainstream for good reason, is initial jobless claims. That's something we get every Thursday, and it, it's considered the most timely piece of information we have. It's a weekly number, and so it tells us how many people are filing for first-time unemployment benefits. And so, this is one that I, I said it's gone mainstream. This is something that everyone is now focused on. You know, we're, we're up above 26 million people now that uh, in the last five weeks have filed for first time unemployment benefits. So, that's about 8% of the population. So, this is a big number. And, you know, even though this number is getting better, I think we're going to be focused on, on this going forward for at least the next several weeks uh, to make sure this number continues to go down. But even though we have probably seen the worst of this of this weekly number, what we focus on now is what they call continuing claims. Again, this is something we get every every Thursday, but it tells you how many people are still filing for uh, unemployment insurance. And so as we move from one, we go to the other, you know, first time unemployment benefits are likely to peak first. And then you focus on continuing claims. How many people still need that help? And until you see that peak, you have to assume that you haven't seen the worst of it yet. And so we'll be looking for that for some kind of a, a sign of a turnaround. And then there's a, a number of uh, high frequency indicators that, that we're going to look at. Um, uh, traffic data, for instance, um, some people cite pollution data, actually, which is kind of interesting, but, you know, makes sense. Um, you know, um, what we're looking at, um, Open Table has been very good about, about providing their, the number of reservations they're taking around the world at, at mm -hmm. uh, restaurants on the Open Table network. And so there's a lot of high frequency data that I think is going to be a lot more helpful this time around than the typical uh, economic sources that we typically rely on. Okay. There's something else that I want to get to as well. So we talked a little bit about you know some of the numbers that are worrisome, but the market's been going up, right? So you know I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about uh, you know the, the federal government and the fiscal policy that they're they're providing, as well as like the, the additional reserves that they've had, um, as well as uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, not to be confused, and the monetary policies they're exercising right now to help support the economy. You know, when when this crisis first began, we, we saw the sell off. We saw the, the stock market fall 34 percent from from peak to trough in, in a really short amount of time. It was the fastest um, fastest that it, it took to uh, shortest time it took to go into a bear market, meaning a 20 percent decline from an all time high um, in, in history. And, and that's far, far beating the, the previous record that was set during the Great Depression. You know, and, and, and so at the time we were talking about, is another depression coming? And, and the reason those, those fears quickly subsided is because the Federal Reserve and Washington, but policymakers, you know, both uh, uh, on the monetary side and the fiscal side, were very quick to respond. So look at the at Federal Reserve. They cut rates down to zero in, in record time in just a couple weeks. And, and they also brought back these crisis era programs to provide liquidity, make sure that, that the bond markets were functioning properly. They've continued to, to take these types of actions to um, restore faith in, in uh, the financial markets. 
uh, essentially. And, and it's done a very good job if you just look at the way different types of markets are now behaving. It, it's much more normal and, and fluid, which is, which is great. They're meeting this week, uh, tomorrow and on Wednesday, and, and they're likely going to, um, not likely to announce further action, but really just going to say, look, we're still watching the data. We stand ready to move and provide additional support if we need to. Mm-hmm. And then Washington, is, as we know, has provided stimulus also. Some estimate it's around 12% of our GDP. So really throwing everything they have at the problem, trying to provide some kind of um, a bridge to get us over this hurdle that we now face, which they, which most think is just a short-term issue. And I, I think the reason that you've seen the market respond and the reason you've seen those, those fears around a depression fade is because historically – you don't fight the Fed, is what they say. That's the saying on Wall Street. You don't fight the Fed. When they put their mind to it that they're going to provide the support, then you you believe them. You take them at their word. If things start to turn, if the credit markets uh, start to uh, misbehave again, the Fed stands ready, and they've proven that they're ready to, to act if needed. And so that's why I, I think the confidence among investors has, has rebounded quite a bit. You know, I... I I alluded to the fact that maybe the uh, confidence among investors had maybe outpaced reality or, or outpaced, you know, um, uh, you, you can't necessarily rationalize the, the speed with which we've recovered. And so maybe we could, there, we're likely to um, give up a little uh, of this or trade sideways for a while. Either way, volatility is likely to be with us because we are still getting information. We are still not, uh, even though we're talking about reopening the economies, we haven't actually done it yet. And so time will tell how smoothly this transition goes and if we're able to do so without seeing a second wave of the virus. And so I don't think we can easily discount those threats or those risks. And so we always want to be mindful and say, okay, even though we think the worst is behind us, we could still see this volatility and some moves to the downside over the near term. But I think if anything, what this move higher did tell us, it's just further proof that you don't want to time the markets and make short-term adjustments when, you know, when your fear is at an all-time high, you don't want to give into that herd mentality and sell and really deviate from a long-term plan because things can change very, very quickly. All right. So, so things can change very quickly. Um, you, you know, you highlighted a little bit of the, the changes that we're having in the portfolio around themes, around technology. And, you know, briefly, would you be able to describe a little bit about um, maybe any other things that you're you're looking to go to or going away from, um, you know, in the portfolios? Yeah, so at the broad asset allocation meeting, uh, in, in just a few minutes, I'll be heading into our weekly investment committee meeting, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, at the broad asset allocation level, we haven't made significant adjustments there um, in, in recent uh, market updates, we've talked about how we uh, trimmed our equity or our risk exposure. Uh, towards the end of last year, we brought our stock exposure from an overweight position, implying that we thought it was a very attractive environment for stocks, brought it back to a more neutral level. Uh, and, and so that's one thing that we did before a lot of this you know, uh, uh, actually happened around the virus, not to say that, that, we, that we saw this uh, coronavirus coming. We certainly didn't, but we just wanted to acknowledge that there were uh, a number of risks that we're building and we wanted to take some of our chips off the table. In hindsight, we're certainly happy that we did. Uh, now, a lot of our recent moves have been around the sector and the stock level. And, and, and so um, uh, adding to areas of healthcare, for example, technology, which I already mentioned, maybe lightening up on, on certain areas um, that, that could be posed to more risk within the consumer space. So those are the types of ways that we need to be thinking. You know, e- even though I, I have said this a few times now, uh, where we think that the worst is behind us, what this sell-off did is it, it certainly brought down valuations. And, and so in some cases, it, it, it brought down valuations on firms that we've been watching for quite a while and just didn't want to pay up for before. And so now we, we went back and revisited some of those ideas and they were trading in more attractive levels. And, and so that's where we've decided to be really opportunistic and, and initiate positions in those types of names. You know, beyond that, there are other areas of the market that we're looking at, you know, within the fixed income side, we are, we're looking at, at uh, things like high yield bonds, an area that we exited um, a little over a year ago. 
And uh, that's uh, another word for high yield is junk. Some people don't like that name, but um, you know, there's, there's a time for these types of investments. And uh, you always want to make sure at the end of the day, just like any other investment, you want to make sure that you're being compensated for the risk that you're taking. When you see uh, the markets uh, uh, dislocate and, and you see them misbehave, uh, for lack of a better word, you, you, uh, it's, this can provide opportunities where you are compensated for the risk you, you might be taking by buying these types of investments. And you're compensated and then some. And so we're looking at those attractive entry points for, you know, for when we might want to get into those investments. We haven't done so yet, but we're looking at them closely, um, you know, for, for that, uh, that right time to be buying them back. Okay. Okay. Um, great. So, so for, for our, our clients um, you know, that are invested with us, that are working with us, um, what are some questions that you think they should be asking their financial advisors um, as it relates to the, this current landscape? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think the first thing is, is, as it relates to them and their plan, I, I think, and I, and I stress this every time we speak, but we have now recovered, um, a, to, to some extent, we're still down on the year, but, but um, you know, we are, we have recovered, as I said, about 30% from, from the low that we saw uh, on, on March 23rd. So now is a good time to kind of reassess your portfolio. If we do see more volatility to the downside, it's a good idea to have those conversations with your client, or excuse me, with your advisor right now to determine whether you're in the right asset allocation. If we see um, risk assets start to underperform again because fear is, you know, uh, reappears in the market. Um, maybe this return to more um, normal activity for the economy, reopening economies doesn't go um, a, according to plan. You know, that could happen. And so making sure that you're in that the appropriate asset allocation for you is, is really important right now. Um, and, and just kind of reassessing your long term game plan. I think that's the, the top thing that uh, the clients should be talking about with their advisors. Okay. Adam, uh, thank you so much. Um, as always, we always like to end with kind of a fun question. Um, and I've been dying to ask this question. I, I tell you what. Uh, so uh, we were fortunate enough to have uh, Professor Lakoff from USC. And you talked a lot about uh, how, you know, you kind of came from a USC family. You also got your, your MBA from UCLA. So can you tell me what was the family conversation like when you told your family, the Trojan family, that you were going to attend uh, UCLA? Wow. Um, sure. So I'm going, I'm going for the hard one. <laughs> you know, I was, I, I might uh, lose half the viewers on this one, um, but um, I, I was raised as a Trojan. My, my father started bringing me to the games when I was four years old. So uh, USC is all I ever knew and, and wanted to be associated with. Uh, I did go and, and get my MBA at UCLA, which I loved. It was an amazing experience. It was actually the first time I was on their campus in my life was for my interview with the director of admissions. And I realized it was actually a really nice place. I was kind of sorry that I had avoided it uh, for my whole uh, life and up until that point. Uh, I think the real, the real problem actually came before my graduation ceremony from that MBA program. Uh, both my wife and my father uh, at, at first uh, weren't so supportive and didn't want to attend the graduation ceremony and, and protest, but eventually they came around. Um, and, uh, we're, we're, a, we're a happy but divided family today. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're a happily divided family. Um, for all of our listeners, thank you so much for, for tuning in. You know, we hope that we've been you know, able to provide you with some valuable information in these current market times. I mean, if you have any questions, please contact your financial advisor. They'll be happy to help you. Um, and thank you so much and stay safe out there. All right. Have, have a great day.